All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the continuous testing uh, meetup. Uh, first of all, let's uh, thank our sponsors for making this possible. Uh, thank you, Source Labs, Trending, and To Amusement. Um, if you want to check out our previous meetups, go to our website, continuoustestingmeetup.com, and check out the recordings. This meetup will also be recorded and available there in a couple of days. All right. I would like to welcome uh, Gleb, um, who is truly one of the greats um, when it comes to uh, software testing. Yeah, 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 you deserve this. Yeah, this is good stuff. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, I give you the stage, Gleb. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Sava. Thank you, Aurelian, for inviting me. And hello, everyone around the world, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Let me share my screen for the presentation that I hope you came for. I hope it's the right one. And yes, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. You can find all my links from my homepage at gleb.dev. And the slides for this presentation is already online. I made them public. The little QR code actually leads to the slides that uh, you can grab if you want. And um, once the video comes out, I will add the link to the video to the slides as well. So you can look at the slides, look at the video. But the slides should be pretty standalone. You don't need me. Uh, for the presentation, if you want to ask questions, I'll keep an eye on the chat widget, right? So. Um, if I can answer the question right away, maybe I'll answer it. Otherwise, I will wait maybe until the end of the presentation to answer anything I see in the chat. Okay, so let's begin, shall we? Uh, I usually start my presentations with a reminder that we're in a climate crisis. The last month was the hottest month of October in the last 25,000 years at least. The last previous 12 months were the hottest 12 months our planet has experienced in the 25,000 or more years, this is a crisis. The only way we can do solve it is to stop emitting greenhouse gases, stop burning things. And I think we can do that, not just individually, but together, right? So there are organizations around the world in every country, every town, every city that work on solving climate crisis. So just find a local one and see what you can do. Okay, uh, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov again. Um, had a long kind of journey from C, C++ days of computer vision and stitching panorama images all the way through C Sharp and Java and CoffeeScript, all the way to Node.js and JavaScript, what I do today. Um, I have a lot of open source projects that you can see on GitHub. Uh, I have YouTube channel where I post little videos because sometimes it's easier to explain something in the blog, but sometimes you want to see it and show it in action. So that's when I record video. I blog a lot because I forget a lot. Honestly, if I don't write something down, I've been blogging for 10 years and I often go to the blog to see how did I do that? How does it work? And I look up stuff constantly. A lot of stuff about testing, a lot of stuff about Cypress. Um, I work at Mercari and I have even done presentations about testing inside large enterprise where you have hundreds and hundreds of daily test runs and you want to do that. So you can find those presentations in a separate um, set of uh, decks of slides. I also create online courses about Cypress and now Cypress was playwright as well. That's what I'm working on right now, adding lessons that kind of show both test runners that are super popular and how would you solve the same problem in each one. During the daytime, I work at Mercari.com. It's a US company. We are a subsidiary of Japanese Mercari. It's online marketplace. You have something that you're no longer using, take a picture, list it. It's very modern online marketplace for selling uh, with personal belongings to someone else. And we do write a lot of tests and we run a lot of tests daily. Um, we have React Native mobile application, but we also have a web front end. And for us being online marketplace, if it doesn't work, it's, it's very bad, right? So this is a typical Mercari end-to-end -end web test uh, running using Cypress. You can see on the left all the commands. In this case, 
we are, I think, communicating between the seller and the buyer after we bought an item about like order status, and we're just checking with everything, the whole back end and front end work correctly. Now, as I said, we run a lot of tests. This is a chart from last year, 2022. Uh, we are up to 800 full end-to-end -end tests covering a lot of areas of our application. We still discover sometimes like particular user flows and we add tests there, but we do have a lot of tests. We run them several times a day. We run them by slicing using test tags into uh, different areas of tests periodically. So we quickly can discover any problems with backend services, APIs, third-party services over front end. So if you ever try to run a lot of end-to-end -end tests, but you find Typical problems, the tests are slow. It takes a while to run all of them. There is flake, right? The test might, you know, ex experience a backend hiccup that's very transient, solves itself. So how do you deal with that? And also the tests are expensive. And aside from CI, continuous integration time, what it takes, right? That's a cost you pay. Also, you somehow you have to report the results. And if you use Cypress Cloud, that's expensive. And I know because I worked at Cypress for four years, that's how a company is making money. Okay, well, I'll show you how to solve the slow part in this presentation. I will not talk about solving Flake. That's a separate topic, right? But I'll show you also how to solve the expensive part. So before we do anything, let me show what Cypress Cloud charges you. If you use Cypress Cloud and you run Cypress tests and you say record all the test results are going to the Cypress Cloud, they give you a list of tests that you run for each test run. They have artifacts like screenshots for each test result that failed. They have videos for each test run. And also the Cypress Cloud is an orchestrator. It actually splits all the specs across multiple machines. So in this case, there are seven machines that joined and executed those tests, for example. And you can see that um, the first machine executed a lot of tests, those green bars are individual specs and tests inside. And then more machines, two and three joined right away. And more machines like four, five, six, seven actually joined later. And yet, you know, Cypress Cloud kind of orchestrating and told each machine what to test. And it's all very nice, right? You like the test artifacts. You like, you know, knowing the results of a test. You you like being able to debug a test. You like being able to split the tests across multiple machines. But unfortunately, that's expensive. So Cypress Cloud charges you based on the usage. So up to 500 test results a month free. And then immediately you go to the $67 a month. And then 267. And if you ask me why 67, I think we multiplied so that the annual is ending with 99. Like, okay, whatever. The problem is this. So what we call test result, that means each test, if you have one test and you execute it once, that's a single test result, which is a very, very low number if you think about it. So if imagine you have a test set with 10 tests, you execute it once per day, 30 days a month. 300 test results. Now, the free layer is 500 test results. So if you execute the same 10 tests twice a day, it's 600 test results. So you're already past that limit. And then you have to jump to 67, right? And then that gives you pretty generous 120,000. So you can see the pricing and the limit. Okay, I'm not going to say anything, but... Okay, it gets expensive. So in this presentation, I'll show you how you can do the same thing that Cypress Cloud gives you, but do it for free. So number one, run all the tests or specs in parallel for free. How to take the test artifacts, the videos, the screenshots, the logs, everything that you need to debug a failing test, because nobody cares about passing tests. But you want to keep the test artifacts so that you can understand why something failed for free. And how do you actually debug fail Cypress tests, right, for free? Okay, so let's start. We're going to start with a very simple example. And I prepared a repository 
where I only have three different spec files, A, B, and C. And inside A, I just have a single task and all it does slips using sci-wait command for 10 seconds. Inside spec B, I'm waiting for one minute and then uh, spec C, 10 seconds again. Very, very basic. And if you run everything locally, you will see the timing, right? You can see that they all are successful because there's nothing that could possibly fail. And let's execute this on continuous integration server. So I'm going to use GitHub Actions. And I'm going to use GitHub Actions for two reasons. One, as an organization, Mercari now uses GitHub Actions with our private cloud and uh, test runners for security. And number B, the reason number B, or reason B, is that I love using GitHub Actions. Like I'm like I, I I'm experienced with lots of CI systems, but as you can see from uh, a couple of links under the YAML file, I actually love using GitHub Actions, and you will see why because they're pretty powerful. Okay, so this is a typical workflow file. All I'm saying, execute this workflow on every commit push. To GitHub, I will run using Ubuntu, and then I have first command that checks out the code. Great, just get the code to the local machine, and then I'm using Cypress.io GitHub Action, which is a reusable GitHub Action that Cypress. Well, I wrote while I was at Cypress, but now they extended it. So I'm grabbing instead of me doing everything. I'm using something that Cypress as a company wrote and have it. And that little piece of reusable code for GitHub Actions knows how to install everything, how to cache everything, and how to execute the task by default. So if I do this and I just push this YAML file, then GitHub show me, shows me the following. Actions checkout, so it grabbed the source code and then it ran Cypress GitHub Action. And it took two and a half minutes and then a little bit of cleanup. And if I click on, for example, Cypress GitHub action, it expands and it shows me pretty much the same thing that I would see locally if I ran all the tests myself, right? Spec A, spec B, spec C, and the timings are the same. 10 seconds, one minute, 10 seconds again. Excellent. Well, the cool thing about using GitHub Action is that it has caching built in. So if I run the same YAML file without changing anything pretty much and just let it run again, then it shaved off 40 seconds because now everything was downloaded. It just restored the cache from previous run and I saved so much time on waiting for that. Okay, that's great. But if you look at you know what we actually ran, on this single CI machine, we ran spec A, spec B, spec C. And if spec A was 10 seconds, then spec B took six times longer, right? Because it took one minute. And then spec C is extra 10 seconds. And there's a little bit of a gap between the specs because, you know, Cypress closes the browser and then opens a new browser for the next spec just to make sure everything is clear, the memory is released, right? So you don't have one spec affecting the run on the second one. And you might ask yourself, wait, like why do we have to use just one machine, right, for this? Because obviously it probably would be faster if you split them up and run things in parallel on two machines. And you can do this locally. So here's what you could do. You can change your CI YAML file, workflow file, and instead of saying, just check out the code and use GitHub Action. You can use GitHub Action, but then specify parameter with. And parameter that you can specify is spec. And you can literally yourself say, on the first machine, the job is E to E1, execute spec A and spec B. And you can list a second job. And you can say, that job should do the same thing, but execute spec C. And because there, there are no dependencies between those jobs, you just said job one, job two, those jobs will run in parallel on GitHub Actions. And uh, Cypress GitHub Action even shows like the summary. So in your Actions UI on GitHub, you see like nice you know, summary of what happened. Machine one executed two tests, both passed, took 70 seconds. 
and machine two executed just one uh, test and it took 10 seconds. So it's all great. Love it. Parallel containers, everything. 70 seconds, 10 seconds. Like, that's fine. But then you might think, well, there should be a better way, right? Because, you know, I don't want to modify and list all the spec files every time. Like, I want to change or add a spec or remove specs right around. Like, so this is why I wrote Cypress Split. And Cypress Split is very different from the clouds. Uh, uh, Cypress Cloud does it dynamically, you know, for which machine does what. Cypress Split is much simpler. It takes a look around. It looks at your Cypress config file, finds all the spec files, and splits them up. So basically, I want to replace this parameter, spec and spec, for two machines with automatic plugin. And this is what I do. I install the plugin, and I add it to the Cypress config file, and that's it. It should work. But the plugin doesn't know which machine it is. Is it machine one or machine two? So you have to actually give it a parameter by setting environment variable split and split index. So split is how many machines are going to join. We know we have two jobs on CI. So the split is two for both jobs. Okay. And then the split index, you tell that job and to the Cypress plugin, you are chunk index zero and chunk index one. So all the indices start with zero by default. Okay. And this is what happens. Cypress split looks around when it starts, finds all the Cypress specs, splits the list into n chunks and takes the chunk with index K. And this is very noticeable when it starts and you look at the CI and it says, okay, I found uh, three different specs. I'm chunk one out of two. And this is the list of spec files I'm going to run. So it does it automatically. So you never have to worry about yourself. You can see the summary. And in addition to the GitHub action from Cypress itself, a company, uh, the Cypress split plugin also understands that if it runs on GitHub Actions, it uses GitHub Actions API to output this detailed summary. So you can see the table with every spec and how long each spec took and the tests inside each spec. So you can actually see what happened inside each machine. Okay, well, this is great, but we can optimize this a little bit. Instead of manually copy paste, copy paste the workflow jobs, inside the CI YAML file, or CI YAML file, I should say, you can do the following using GitHub Actions. You can create a matrix of jobs. Instead of copy paste, you can say, I have a strategy and the strategy is matrix. And there are only two containers and what's inside the container doesn't matter. I am using numbers one, two, so it's clear how many jobs will be. But I'm also specifying fail fast false. So basically, by default, when GitHub Actions runs a matrix of jobs, if one fails, then it shuts down all the rest. But we don't want that. We want to keep going. And even if one container failed end-to-end -end test, we want to uh, continue running other specs, right? So that's why I fail fast. So in this case, I'm only defining a single job, but at runtime, it will uh, create two. And I can use special GitHub expressions called strategy.jobtotal. So in this case, it will be replaced by number two for both machines. And split index, well, that's just the job index that GitHub provides. So for the first job, it will be zero. For the second job, it will be one. And this is how it shows its UI, right? It actually groups them all and says, this is a matrix. Uh, and there are two jobs in the matrix. Okay, and just really quickly, yes, um, GitHub, oh, thanks. Cypress split works with on any CI, okay? You just have to tell how many machines you have and what's the index for each machine. And some CIs have it built in, I believe. 
uh, I believe like Circle and maybe even GitLab, they have an environment variable, so it makes it very simple. But it should work on any CI. And if you look at the README, Cypress Split has information for many, many CI providers. So, okay, so this was nice. Uh, I have two machines, perfect. I ran, uh, you know, but this is very primitive example, right? What if you have 500 end to end? Look, if you want to go faster, well, we had two machines in our strategy, two containers. You want to go faster, add more machines, but you don't have to change anything else. If I had lots of tests, lots of specs, and they were running slow on two machines, I would now use five, and now I would split all the specs in the list five ways. And if that's not enough, just split them across 10 machines, right? It's literally at the end of the day, if all the specs are approximately equal in duration, then if I use N machines, it would be total duration divided by N, okay? Super. Well, when I said approximately equal duration, I, I kind of gave away the problem. And you probably looked at the problem and you said, okay, well, you split it this way, alphabetically, A, B, C. And when you split it two ways, so the first chunk had two specs, A and B, and the second machine only had one spec C. And just looking at the bar, right, you're like, this is very, very suboptimal. Can you do it differently? You probably want to do it like this. Because we know spec B takes one minute and spec A plus spec C together take 20 seconds. So you probably, if you have two machines, that's how you want to split it up. So the whole idea is to go away from using alphabetical list to use previous spec duration timings. Okay. Here's what you can do. Right now, using Cypress Split, you can actually compute those timings yourself the first time you run. And I just kind of fake it by saying split file timings.json. It doesn't exist. And I'm running with split one. So one machine should execute all the specs. And I'm doing this kind of special thing just so that it outputs this JSON and saves it in timings.json file. And it will have durations. Basically, run it once and shows me how long each spec took by measuring it, right? And then gives me the file. And the first time I run it, I can save it file, commit it to the repo and push the code. And in this case, I'm gonna update my YAML file in addition to split and split index. I will add one more environment variable called split file. And this should point at what existing timings.json. And what split, Cypress split plugin will do, it will, okay, like load all the specs, look up the timings in timings.json. And if it doesn't have a timing for that particular spec file, it will take the average of all the specs. So kind of like, okay, fine. And then it sorts all the specs from longest to the fastest. And then now it takes all those specs and it sticks it into the and machines, and all it does is it grabs a spec, puts it in a bucket with the smallest total duration sum. So here's how it works in, in our example. We have two buckets for two machines, and we have three specs. And first thing we do, we sort them. So spec B is the longest, and that's spec A, spec C. And we take a look at spec, that's the first one, Okay, it goes into first bucket because it has nothing. And then spec A, well, it will go into the bucket with, that has nothing right now because the sum is the, the smallest. And then spec C, again, we inspect both buckets and we ask, what's the total sum of durations? Okay, well, that means spec um, C goes into the second machine. So very simple kind of static pass across all the specs and putting them into the buckets. And this is what we observe in our CI. The first machine will say split free specs using durations from timing the JSON file, and it's just spec B, but we expect to take one minute and uh, 90 milliseconds. 
And the second machine says the same thing, but it uses the same timings file, right? The same information. So it's taking the specs C and A, okay? And uh, it takes spec C first because in our first run, it took 10,075 milliseconds. And spec A took two milliseconds shorter. I mean, sometimes these numbers are random. Okay, well, this might work the first time you ran this, right? But then you have to maintain this timing JSON. You might add specs, you might rename specs, you might split them up. So what happens? You might actually optimize, you know, particular spec. All you have to do, okay, is maybe have a separate workflow that you run nightly on a single machine and this is what you can do. You can say, again, one machine, index zero, split file, and the name of a file. And at the end of a run, Cypress split will say, okay, I have new timings. Maybe there is a new spec. Maybe it changed by more than 10%. It actually will overwrite timings.json. And remember, right now you're running on CI. But luckily for GitHub, you can say, okay, if you're running on CI, in a, it's a main branch. Just commit whatever changes you have to a file pattern timings that JSON and say updated spec timings as a commit message. There is a reusable action that uses the GitHub token, commits local files if there are any changes, and then pushes the code back to the repo. And notice, I didn't have to configure any security, any you know, Git access SSH keys. When you run GitHub Actions, they're integrated with security of GitHub itself. So it's so simple to like update your code and push the changes back if there are any changes. You think about all your code formatting tools, linting tools, code creation tools, code generation tools, or documentation tools. You can run them nightly. Any changes automatically push it back. Okay. So in this case, I can trigger the workflow from the UI and say, run those like, nightly specs. I don't have to wait for night. This is what it shows at the end. It says, okay, these are the updated timings. They're slightly different, but they haven't actually changed more than 10%. I have a little fuzzy, so it doesn't update the file if it's like two milliseconds. So nothing has changed. Nothing was committed. I can see that that reusable action says, Everything is clean, timings that JSON has not changed. But if I actually had something, right, go. Okay, so the question that you might ask, yeah, why do I need that special job? If you have a lot of specs, it actually might take a long time to go one by one, okay? So I will show you how I actually do it in, in the real world. Just trust me, wait one minute. Okay. Uh, and yes, um, this presentation will be shown at Boston Code Camp uh, on, on Saturday as well. Maybe even better, because now that I practice here, I might change a couple of slides. So don't worry. Every time I read the presentation, I do modify a lot. Okay, this is the thing. Anytime I work on any tools, I want the developer experience to be as simple as possible, like as simple as this paperclip. Right, it's like very hard to mess up a paperclip. So, remember our uh, workflow file, right? We have now two workflow files, two workflow files. One with parallel test runs, another one just to update the timings. Okay, because I use GitHub Actions so many times, and I use Cypress a lot, and this question of do I update and, and stuff, I decided to make it simple. And I wrote a reusable, not action, but reusable workflow. So on GitHub, not only you can run a reusable steps, GitHub actions, but you can actually provide a reusable workflow, like bunch of steps and bunch of jobs together. And I wrote a reusable Cypress workflow for like simple cases, parallel cases, like and the split ones. If you use Cypress split, here's a workflow for you. You want to run. You, you know your test by checking out the code 
And when splitting everything across two machines, this is it. That's the whole workflow. It uses my reusable workflow from this repo and you specify parameters. So for end-to-end -end test, you say two machines. You want a four? Just put number four. No, no longer you need to this like strategy, matrix, containers, parameters. And this also supports component tests, but I'm not going to say anything. But this is what it expands to. Remember, all these details, you don't have to worry about them. Reusable workflow takes care of everything and creates a matrix of end-to-end -end jobs uh, right there. You can see it called split end-to-end -end test, like right here. Okay, and there are two jobs here. And it prepared the code and the matrix and everything. We did not specify any component tests, so that's why none. And we did not need anything about merging results or timing. So this why these steps, these jobs are skipped, but we can do that uh, as well. So someone asked me, why can't you just use parallel job and combine the timings from different machines because remember each machine executes different spec files so it creates its versions of timings json if you want to run across multiple machines update the timings file and then merge them and then do something where is the parameter so i took care of it it uh, will update parameters and then when you run this you can see this particular job that merges separate timings uh, timings the JSON files into a single combined one. Um, so um I really you're you're right. Obviously you tie yourself to a particular CI implementation. That's why I like splitting my stuff into plugins like Cypress Split that operate in your JavaScript in your process. But at the same time I do like CI specific configuration file or actions that actually tie to specific provider and hide the complexity from the user because only this particular thing is tied to the user but it's pretty generic if you have another provider like circle you could probably write something like a circle CI or but we'll use Cypress split and combine results for you okay so this is all good we have a combined time with JSON. Now we need to commit it. Unfortunately, to get it back from a workflow, you have to do something like this. You say, okay, here's another job. It grabs output from the output that's created automatically from this job. Okay. So it's passed almost like a JSON blob. And notice I'm just echoing that blob into time JSON. So I have a merge file. I'm writing it down on, on disk. Okay. And once I've written, I commit it. Okay. So kind of not ideal, but that's the simplest way I could do it because in GitHub workflows, steps and actions and workflows can take input parameters and also produce outputs. And that's what I'm using right here. Okay. So this is great right well this is okay the big problem is we're not just interested into splitting stuff across multiple machines right we're also interested in reporting the results right meaning results of individual run and especially results of um fail tests that allow us to debug a failing test because to me the worst thing is like if we our tests are slow when running on ci and if they fail, it's hard to debug them. Maybe I have to run the test locally, hope it still fails and be able to debug it. That's the worst situation. But if you have fast tests where they run very quickly on CI, but it takes a long time to debug it, that's not much better because running on CI is actually cheaper compared to my time of debugging a failed test, right? Because I'm a human and I'm expensive. CI machines are cheap, no matter you know what happens. So I would prefer the test to be slower, but if they fail, being faster at debugging. And of course, the ideal situation would be the test is fast, and if something fails, I'm like, can debug them very quickly. That's ideal. But 
So to show what I'm doing right now, I need a more complicated example. So instead of always like empty, wait for 10 seconds, wait for one minute, I have a to do MVC. And there are only three kind of blocks here. I'm loading the page, adding three to do items. Then I'm marking one of them completed and I check that only one is marked completed and the rest are not. And then I'm clicking on clear completed button and I'm making sure that the right number of um, to do items is displayed. So this is how the test looks when I run it locally in interactive mode right after I wrote. Um, on the right, I see the iframe. On the left, I see all the commands. And in Cypress interactive mode, I can use time traveling debugger by just hovering. It shows how the page look at that moment. It highlights the elements. If anything goes wrong, I can quickly debug things here, right? Because I can see the behavior after each click, after typing, did it do the right thing? Is it the right element? And so on. So that's great locally. But what happens on CI? If something goes wrong, well, the best thing that I can hope for are the test artifacts that actually show what happened during the test. And the test artifacts could include console logs, screenshots if it failed, right, the images, browser videos that show the whole thing when it ran. So I can see maybe something went wrong before the failure. Maybe the logs of each command in Cypress right? Like how many elements did I find? Did I click on the right element, the assertions and so on? Code coverage. Did I test everything? Maybe it went to whatever. And traces. And the traces would be equivalent of this interactive time traveler debugger that I'll show later. Okay. So if I just look at what the logs give by default on CIs, this is it, right? I have some messages from the web app server, right? Like those uh, network calls, but it's pretty bare, all right? There's, there's nothing really. So let's postpone the logs for now. What about screenshots? If you use my reusable workflow, all you have to do is to add a parameter, store artifacts, true. Because Cypress by default saves a screenshot on failure and it generates a video of an entire test run of a browser. So if I use store artifacts true, then I can come back to the GitHub page. And, and if you use GitLab or Circle, whatever provider, you just store those folders, Cypress slash screenshots, Cypress slash videos. But this is GitHub UI, where's a zip file, I just grab it and I can find the following. I can see, Okay, it's playing already. I can see MP4 file. That's the whole spec file. I can see it added a couple items, right? Everything is good. Now, let me introduce a failure on purpose. So instead of saying there is one item like it should be, for some reason, I changed my spec file and I said there should be 10 items. So the server logs, right? Whatever GitHub action um, produces and GitHub shows, they give you just an exception, right? And it's okay, not perfect. It says found one, expected 10, but what is it referring to? You don't know. So this is where the screenshot that's included in the zip file is very important. So by default, Cypress takes the screenshot of a browser at the moment of failure. So now I can see, oh, wait, yes. One item meant the number of completed items. Why, why did I expect 10? I can clearly see one right there in the page that I see on the right. There is one completed for to-do item. So I can understand the failure from the screenshot. But even better, you can see the video, right? And you can kind of see it. Okay, so that's all good. But notice, right, it's kind of hard to process the commands that led up to the failure. And this is, I am using something to improve the logs. So this is called Cypress Terminal Reporter. It's one of the plugins. This is the whole configuration. You just include it in your config file and it starts listening to all the events that happened during the test in the test runner. And now if I go back to my GitHub, all of a sudden I see the following. 
instead of like kind of test started, test failed, and then assertion expected one item found 10, or, or I can see a very nice color coded log that shows what the application actually logged in the browser. I can see each command that Cypress run, like every get, every find, every assertion that's passed. And I can see the failed assertion at the end. So I can now understand everything that went during the test, right? Not just a screenshot and I don't have to watch the video. Like those are available, but I can see the details of each particular command during end-to-end -end test and each particular assertion. And this works very nicely with another plugin. So remember, we're not just interested in a single test run, we're interested in all the specs, right? And for that, we need a report, preferably HTML report, right? Something that anyone from dev team, QA team, even management, if, if they're feeling very smart, that can open and see all the test results. And so I use Cypress Terminal Reporter already, and I'm adding Cypress Mocha Awesome Reporter. And this is the whole setup. I'm installing it in a config file together. And in my spec or support file in the browser, I just also have to install them and kind of connect them. And this is what happens after that. The test runs on CI, it fails. Let's say I download the zip and let me play. So this is a static HTML report that I open in my browser. So uh, let me just really quickly. You can see the number of tests, only one test, one failed. It shows at the top the error right away. Okay. But then you see the whole test. So you can understand what the test code was. Okay. That's great. But then down there, you see the, the terminal command log with every command and every assertion. It's not colored coded, it's just text, but it's nicely formatted. I can see and understand everything. And so it goes all the way right here to a failed assertion. Okay. And then the screenshot is included already and the video is included. Okay. And, and yes, um, this terminal reporter, it actually listens to the console log messages in the browser. So it should include anyone or anything that calls console log, console.info. And in the terminal, at least, those are color coded differently, right? Um, and I'm sure we can intercept for a party as well, because at the end of the day, all those calls, they either use like console.error, console.info. So if you wrap it first, for party libraries will be intercepted. So this is kind of like a full report that is very useful. If something goes wrong, you can store it as a test artifact and, and do it. Okay, so I showed how to do these things for free. Now let's talk about coverage and traces. And these are short sections, so we're almost there. Okay, if you instrument your end-to-end -end tasks, I have a blog post about that. Cypress will produce code coverage report. Now you run things on multiple machines, so each code coverage report will be a partial one. Okay, so in this case, I'm running four end-to-end -end machines that run end-to-end -to -end tests. I'm running a bunch of component tests across two machines because component tests are much faster. And then I'm giving a parameter coverage true that tells my workflow at the end of the day, each machine will produce a JSON file with code coverage, grab them, merge them. And you can see the workflow now ran two component um, tests across two machines for end to end. And then it grabbed the code coverage from each machine, merge it all into one um, report and it even generated a summary comment in the GitHub action summary. So I can see 100, 100, 100, perfect. But I can also download the HTML report and drill down and really see 
uh, what happens under the hood, it's, it's more likely that you would have something lower, right? But you can drill down into each folder that has less than 100. You can drill down into each source file and you can find which particular code you did not reach, did not exercise either through end-to-end -end or for component tests. And it's not a number that's important. It's for you to understand something that you did not test. Is it important to test what kind of end-to-end -end test or component test or even unit test should you write to reach that particular code to make sure it's working as expected? Okay, so that's great. Let's forget it. Because the important thing is right now, last couple of weeks, you are the traces. Um, the traces uh, were first popularized by Playwright, right? Where you run test dash dash trace and it captures the behavior of a browser like elements, the changes, the commands, and then you can replay to understand what happened during the test. Uh, it's not a Playwright thing. You can actually send a flag using Chrome debugger protocol to the Chrome compatible browsers and say, start capturing a trace and stop it and it will produce it for anything. So this person wrote a plugin for Cypress. And this is the recording of a test that failed, but I'm then replaying, right? It's just a JSON file and you can replay it. So let me start it. And you kind of see the iframe inside and you can see the command log on the left. And as you can like go to different commands, you can see what the application did. And the cool thing, it actually reconstructs the DOM in the middle. So you have a DOM snapshot at that moment. It's not perfect by any means yet, but it's actually pretty good. Cool. So in CI, you run this, you produce this recording trace, and then you can play this trace yourself locally by just dropping a file. And you can see what the application did and how it behaved. You have console log you have network traffic, all the information. Okay. So is everyone excited? Everyone wants to use it, right? Because this is, seems to be the best, right? Most powerful option. You're not just getting a video. You're not just getting a screenshot. You're not just getting a command log in a terminal. You're getting everything. Okay. So raise your hands if you want to use it today, right? I want to use it. I tried it. Ooh. All right. If you try to use it locally, it works. If you try to run this particular thing or something from like Deploy Sentinel company, like different trace capturing things, it will block you. Or Cypress will block you saying, hey, you're trying to use a module we don't allow, right? Because it's competing with our business. That whole cloud, you know, uh, Cypress Cloud now has traces that are captured automatically. So in addition to videos and screenshots, you can actually do the same thing that I just showed in the cloud natively. And so they disabled some of the competing things that um, you know people use because nobody likes 500 test results, but nobody likes paying money. And so, okay. So they kind of went with this nuclear option. So we'll see how it shakes out, right? I, I'm not a big fan of this decision, but... I'm not at Cypress, so nobody should listen to me. Whew. Okay. In a summary, okay, I've shown how you can take your Cypress tests and run all of them across multiple machines for free, right? Because most CI providers can now give you multiple containers, multiple machines. So you can just say to different machines, split them up, all the specs, and execute them faster. It's very important for you to capture all the test artifacts because it's not running the specs that matters. It's if something goes wrong, how fast can you debug it? And what information do you use to debug it? Just screenshot, just videos? You have to capture everything and there are plugins that create a nice report with all this extra information for you to use. Maybe not traces perhaps for now, but everything else is available and not blocked. And finally, I collected all the main resource links for this presentation so you can quickly go to different plugins and different blog posts uh, that explain how to do everything. And with that, I reached the end of my presentation and I wanna thank you for your attention.
If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. And I'm looking uh, through right the, chat the chat as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree, GitHub Actions is much better on Clippy. That's but it should be as simple as paperclip. You know, but I was looking for like what is very simple thing. And I don't want to use like a wheel or anything, right? Something has to be something modern. And paper clips are pretty modern, turns out. Um, so I have a question. I'm not super involved with Cypress anymore, but back then when a customer didn't want to use the cloud solution, we were using something called Sorry Cypress. I don't know if that is still around, but if yes, can you compare it to your solution? I mean, the name is pretty funny, but yeah. Uh, That's exactly ahead. what we dis disabled. Not only we disabled like this particular trace, this trace was ah, created okay. by a person from uh, Sorry Cypress. Ah, okay. And mm -hmm. okay. if you look at my subs, like publishing Substack, I link to like several explanation blog post that Cypress published. Basically, we said they're infringing on our intellectual property, kind of hinting at the name Cypress, right? Um, so, um, so this is currents.dev. Um, I, I can I can understand that, right? At the same time, if you look at the at, at what I've written, I still am collecting my thoughts about the whole thing. And it mm. cannot be just name, right? So sorry, Cypress is the open source project. And when he started a company called currents.dev, where yeah. he just has a hosted version of sorry, Cypress, I like, you can f see my tweets. I always find the name sorry, Cypress as being really, really in bad taste, right? Like I understand um, you don't want to pay fine. Do yeah. what I did. Right, combine things, have plugins, but don't call yourself like, like, if I go and I create a version of Windows, right, or whatever, like Microsoft Online, Office Online, and I call it Sorry Office, you can imagine how quickly Microsoft will go down on you, right? Yeah. You will not survive a month, right? Cypress kind of was like ignoring him for five years now, four years, right? Mm -hmm. They're fine. But what yeah. happened now, I believe, they now release something called traces, right? Like what I showed, the same thing. And turns out, <laughs> Sorry Cypress, aka Currents, released their traces plugin a couple months before because they're using the Chrome debugger protocol to just right capture everything from this iframe and, and save it. So they actually were first, right? And they have a name that competes. And Cypress, the company, has a new a board member that represents one of the venture capital investors in a company. Mm. So, of course, okay. they looked around and says, what are you doing, right? You have to kind of stamp on everything. I think the whole thing could be avoided and everyone would not be angry at Cypress for pulling this kind of non-open source friendly action. If they mm. went all the way, right? Uh, to when they did, you know, their pricing table. And like, of course, like, I, what, what do I know, right? But if you look at the pricing, right? If you have 20 tests per day, you blow the limit. If they increase that limit to a couple of thousand, right? So that a small company can actually run their test for free or for like 10 bucks, wherever, just to get them paying. They would completely starve oxygen from because who wants to self-host software, right? It actually costs you time and time for one developer. If, if you're not paying even a hundred dollars to a developer, right? Then it's like so. Who wants to host self-host? Who wants to pay everything? So this whole mm -hmm. thing is just because the pricing is completely whack, and now mm -hmm. the goodwill is is gone. I think so. also. The metric they are using puts them kind of against good practices, right? You want to split your tests up when it makes sense yes. in the in the test, and not because you want to save some money. You make an extra long test. It's just not uh, healthy for your um, ecosystem. It should just not be a consideration when setting up your tests. 
it it should be something else um but you know it's it's interesting right i look at the whole situation and the real question is okay if it's about the name right if uh sorry cyprus and uh the cyprus debugger how they call the tracer if they rename it okay is it enough because they also deployed something from company called deploy sentinel that does the same tracing and actually works very well from what i've seen really well mm -hmm. like lovely right will they unblock it right because that's the real thing well we'll, we'll see it's very interesting times nice thank you very much yeah um, i know it was a bit of a political topic but it's uh was interesting yeah. uh, i think it's fun yeah. to discuss other people finances <laughs> yes uh, i mean they have to get those 40 million back uh some way right yeah um so um i think um uh idila um you feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask your question uh yes um so yeah, it's kind of long. Um, um, I'm working right now in the company. Hi, everyone. First, <laughs> um, it's a, like a booking funnel company, and inside the booking, there are many teams who works independently. Uh, there's sometimes lack of like gap of knowledge between the teams, or uh, yeah, many other issue or like challenges right now uh and also we don't have end-to-end -end tests and every team has their own um integration tests and, and unit tests and it's hard right now for me to promote or like encourage people that we need or end-to-end -end tests can be beneficial for us uh so far there's only one person or one team who is interested uh but obviously like moving forward it's almost impossible to work on it and maintain especially uh yeah so have you ever encountered this challenge because i tried different approach different stack different <laughs> uh presentation in different level but uh yeah so far not successful yet um and if anyone has encountered this challenge how it was solved and also i think it seems to me that uh, others don't see the benefit of it uh and also how should be the metrics of end-to-end -end tests so maybe if we can agree on that it's easier to like advertise this because it's not to catch like bug from like each team because it's already covered like by integration tests or and also manual and other tests yeah. it's a great I'm question good. mind if i answer it first Seva, and then maybe you can add um i just posted the link in the chat with my presentations because i had the same thing in my company it's a large company that brought me in specifically to solve end-to-end -end testing uh look at the first presentations the kind of versions of the same only they were done at different times so they might be different but they start with the same thing you have to look at different parts of a company these are all different audiences, right? Because trying to convince developers that automated testing is important is very different from trying to convince managers or vice presidents that automated testing is worth investing. And it's very different from manual QA, right, department, because manual QA, they hear automated testing, they hear lost jobs, I'll be fired, right? So you have to look at all different audiences and find what are their needs and how can i promote automated testing the thing that i'm passionate and i, I think it's a good solution solves not my problem but their problem right for example for management you can say every time we have a bug or under tested thing we're losing money and here are like the latest bugs and regressions and outages like in my company we had a bug for unrelated to web testing but but cost us fifty thousand dollars per hour we had an incident right we calculated and we're like this is it this is what right 
And I'm not going to say what the total was, but it was so easy to say, hey, one hour of our business down or whatever, this particular thing, this is how much, and this is what we need to prevent it in the future. Okay. If you go to QA, you can say, by using this automated testing, you can move away from kind of low hanging, boring fruit and going towards exploratory testing, security, accessibility, right? Usability testing that right now you can't because you bug down in this, like click on this button, check the text appears, click on this button, right? Developers, they, they, they would think testing is a chore, right? But you can say, hey, with a little bit of automation, you can actually deliver your product faster and not constantly be bogged down by, hey, something you delivered three months ago, well, now we don't know how it works or ever worked, and you should look at this again, all right? So once you align all the different groups by literally talking to all of them, you can kind of tailor your strategy into how I can introduce testing and not just kind of say, oh, why don't you do testing? Why don't you do more testing? Why am I the only one that cares? Because they have a different problem than what you have. So that's my answer. Um, I would like to add uh, to this um, why end-to-end -end test, right? Because you already have some integration tests and unit tests and all that, and that's a great foundation because those are the tests that help you find out what is wrong. The end-to-end -end yeah. tests are really there to tell you that the stuff that most people are using will work. Um, yeah. I, I kind of compare it to like the, the unit and the integration test when you have a car and you want to buy it and you only have yeah. like 10 minutes to figure out if you should buy this car or not. Yeah. Um, you can start disassembling the car and see if the spark plug is working or if you can use the steering wheel and uh, maybe two components at once, turn on the lights and all that, or you can turn the car on and drive it around the block one time. Right. If the yeah. car you turn the if you turn the key and it doesn't work, it might yeah. still be a good you buy are, yeah. because you do not know why it's not working. Right. Maybe yeah. just the key is broken, but the car is super cheap and it would be a great deal to buy it. But for that, you have to look under the hood. But if you start the car and you can go around the block, you already know this is worth it. Yeah. And this is what end to end tests, I, I think, are really for. It's to make sure that all those individual components in the end do what the user wants. And it's the only test that actually tries to do stuff like the user. And that's different from um, proving that technical solution work technically. That's right. And even for us, like this is just a landing page, right? But even that causes so many microservices to go into action that do suggestions, right? And search results. Like even anonymous users that just come to the landing page and look for something like use the search, there's so many APIs that get involved, right? So many microservices, like there's only like end-to-end -end testing. And we constantly find, you know, things that were like misconfigured somewhere. Yes, we have unit tests and integration tests, but at the end of the day, the user doesn't care. They see the landing page, they use it, right? And if something doesn't work, we have to quickly fix it. And end-to-end -end tests are perfect because if they work, chances are high that when the user does it, it will work too. Yeah, thank you. It's helpful. Uh, I think the mistake that uh, I did in the past is that um, having workshop or presentation with a mixed audience and like every process, yeah, their own uh, expectation and vision. So yeah, thanks a lot. Right. Good luck. And um, of course, I mean, in the end, it's a culture thing. And if you're the only one trying to change the culture of a company, you will use yourself up. Um, it's You have to be conservative or conserve your energy where it's appreciated. And if it's not, it might not be the best place to be, yeah. um, to be a bit harsh, maybe. <laughs> um, we, we also have a raised hand from Alex. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Hi there. I'd just like to add a tiny bit to what's been said already, which has been, I think, really good advice. Um, just from my own experience, a few things um, is to, um, what Cleb was saying earlier, is identify the different stakeholders and work out what their needs are ahead of time. Like put it in a notepad or something, you know, work out what people's motivations are. And then maybe try and find some people who, are, if they're not bought into your idea, they're at least neutral about it. And maybe see if you can work with them and just 
even just prototype something do a very thin slice rather than than uh, presentation presentation where, where i used to work we had so many presentations sometimes people really just wanted to see proof of concept or something and if you can do a, a very thin slice about what you're talking about and just go well hey this took us you know a couple of afternoons over three weeks um uh, you know a couple of afternoons a week and together we we built this thing and can you see how we could extend it and then you've got something much more concrete to to demonstrate rather than you know a theory which maybe your your, your um, delivery people are going to go well, how much time is that going to take up you know what is it delivering if you've got something already you've prototyped it then that's you know that takes you several steps further down the line of getting where you want and you've made some friends doing it hopefully as well so that's that's happy power for you I, I, yeah. alex i've done this because i would look at our like slack channels with a bunch of departments and sometimes they're like a bug report right and i would like oh look at this this service wherever and i would throw end-to-end -end test that kind of exercise that and show that bug right i kind of did reproduction myself just by like observing and then that team sees it as like oh wow we can do that right why don't we have more tests like that because then we would catch it on a pull request and i would add like integration from there like pull request to running end-to-end -end test like targetly and posting result back and, and then they see the value so one, you know, kind of a feature of an another feature. So trying to show by example, the web team, this is how easy the test is. This is how it catches the regression, you know, shipping team, this is it, uh, whatever, uh, chat with a user, right? The help desk kind of functionality. Here's another test for you kind of. So once I showed it to different people on my own, where we didn't have to plan, we didn't have to allocate time, they were bought in. And next time they're like, yeah, let's write a test for this, right? Absolutely. I think I think yes. having having realistic expectations around de developers, you know, you get any any group of developers, a certain percentage of them are never going to write tests, or if they do, they probably won't be very good. And a certain percentage are like, yeah, I'm an engineer, I can do that if I want to. And, and if you can talk to those the second group of people and you know take up ten percent of their time, sometimes you're going to get some good results. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Getting individuals first on your side before you try to do organizational changes. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Any other questions? All right. Then thanks, everybody. It was a great session. Let me take over the screen real quick. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yet. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So um thanks everybody. You can see my screen, I hope. Yeah. Um so thanks everybody. This was a great session. Uh, it will be uploaded to our website in the next couple of days. Um, we will also notify you in the meetup group so you can check it out once it's ready. Uh, lastly, I want to announce the next and last meetup of the year. Uh, Diego, one of our own organizer, is um, talking about how to use Docker to containerize your end-to-end um, -end tests and make them accessible for everybody this way. So I would love to see you there. Um, have a nice evening. Thanks again for everybody. Great questions. And have a nice evening. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.